Well, praise the name of Jesus. Again, we come to worship our Lord and to preach his word today. I want to welcome any streamers that might be watching or that will watch, and I pray God's blessing on the word today. Um, if my people would stand, we will uh, open up in the word. If you'll stand while we read the scripture today, the holy word of God. We're going to be reading in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 19, chapter 20 of John, the Gospel of John, verse 19. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, forgiven. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time of praise and worship. Oh, Lord, we do praise you and worship you with all our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit, I pray in the name of Jesus. Give me the words. Help me to share that that I feel like you want me to share today. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, our spiritual eyes, our spiritual ears, that we might hear what you might have for each one of us today. And may the Lord Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our hope, be lifted up in this message today. And we give you the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. My people may be seated. Well, we just had Easter three Sundays ago, and we're still preaching on those 40 days where he showed himself after the resurrection because Jesus had a, well, still a major job to do. For three and a half years, he ministered in all kinds of ways to reveal who he was, to reveal the love of the Father for us, to reveal the glory and power of God, and uh, to, of course, I guess as important as anything, to reveal that it was through him and the work of the cross that our sins would be forgiven and that we had a way to God. For he said, he said that he was the way, the truth, and life, and there's no way to the Father except through him. So during those three and a half years, he'd proven, you might say, to the people, to the Jewish nation, to his followers, that he was the Messiah, though many and most rejected him. But now he's got 40 days, he's been resurrected, and really his mission actually changes and when you think about it i'll just say this briefly but but when you think about it his ministry in three and a half years was different from his ministry of these 40 days and his ministry now sitting on the right hand of the throne of god actually is different it says there's diversities of gifts but the same spirit in first corinthians chapter 12 it says there are differences of administrations but the same lord and so what we have, we're being told there in 1 Corinthians by the Apostle Paul, is that Jesus is now administering the kingdom of God during the church age. And he is sitting there as judge as well. And so we see here where he, he's administering now, he's, he's doing a work before going to sit on the right hand of the Father. He's doing a work which is more personal. He's doing a work that that he has to make sure that, that the disciples, the what we call the apostles, and 
those disciples as well that followed, but he must make sure that they are where they need to be personally and uh, that their faith will be where it needs to be personally, that they can accomplish. You know, we just kind of take for granted we're sitting in our churches and there's millions and millions of Christians and the history of the church and millions now and still more and more to come. And we kind of take for granted uh, the fact of the church, but but if you think about it, what a huge, what a huge job, what a huge uh, thing Jesus was sending these apostles out to do. And so we see that, uh, we see in this text, we see in the other texts in the Gospels, what uh, what he needs to do. He had a personal job to touch Peter in particular. We talked about that last week as he would be called to be primarily the leader of the church, early church. And he had to break him down just a little bit more and yet confirm his love for him. And we also see, I, I read that Thomas wasn't here on this appearance, but the next Sunday night we see where Thomas is there and Jesus does a special super a personal ministry with Thomas because Thomas apparently was a little bit like Peter. He says, I won't believe unless I see with my mind, with my heart. And of course, I believe God also wanted that to speak to our hearts because we don't physically get to see and hear and listen to Jesus as, as they did for three and a half years. And so we see a work where for, th for 40 days, Jesus is committed now to doing what needs to be done to send out his apostles because they had a big, 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 big job ahead of them. Plus, they need to be committed enough they, that most of them, almost every one of them, died sharing the gospel in the different countries around the world, spreading the gospel and the reason for you and I even to be here today. I want to just briefly go through the text. We're going to focus, though, we're going to come back and focus on what I titled the message, Why We Worship on Sunday, and, and uh, is that the day we're supposed to worship on, and so on. And I'll come back to that, because that's my focus today, as far as the main point goes. And so as we look at these, this text today, let's just run through, in general, what we see we see one thing in the text. We see where Jesus was able to just appear to the apostles, even though the door was shut. The implication is, and, and I believe it's mentioned also, that same thing is mentioned in one or two of the other Gospels as well, but the, the implication is he could just show himself, show up wherever he wanted, locked door or no locked door. He was right there in the room and revealed himself to them. And we see where he tells them peace, be unto them, and uh, and we see where uh, he knew, of course, that they had fear, and so that's why he, in this one we're showing that he says peace, and he does, I think, in the others too. We see where uh, Jesus does not give the Great Commission here. I find that very interesting. In John's writing, we don't hear the, the Great Commission, um, but we have something very unusual at the end of the text, it says he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. I'm probably going to speak on that next week as our fourth week of the 40 days. We're, we're getting closer to Pentecost ourselves. And so, in a way, I'm not going to say much about breathing on them, but he told them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. We'll talk in more detail probably next week on that. Now, if you look at the other Gospels, let me, let me mention some of the things that we see that first, e e that first evening that he shows himself to the apostles. In some of the other Gospels, we've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in those three, we see where he rebukes them for their lack of faith. They had plenty of testimony, and I I've spoke on this in one of the, or two of the other messages, but it's a very important issue for us to see that Jesus is not happy when you've had people tell you about him and you won't receive it. 
we are supposed to receive. That's the, the word gone forth from God. That was his plan that we would receive by hearing the word of God. And God's not happy when we don't share the gospel because how are people going to get saved? We say we want people to get saved, and yet we, if we don't share the gospel, I'm sure if he was standing here today, especially in America where we have churches on every corner, and yet so many that never share the gospel of Jesus Christ, we would probably get a rebuke as well. In Matthew, he tells them that all power is given unto him. You, what, a, what a statement if you just stopped and thought about that for a moment. He's saying all power in heaven and earth has been given unto him, and that's in Matthew. In Mark, we're told the Great Commission in an expansive way, you know, go and preach the gospel to every creature, and he that believeth in the saved shall be, uh, shall be saved. And, and uh, he talks about signs and wonders and all those things in, in, in the Great Commission that he tells us in Mark. In Luke, he tells us and confirms that he's not a spirit. He did that here as well. He said, look at my hands and my feet. Uh, he showed them his hands and his feet in, in, in Luke. Uh, he reminds them of the scriptures that the Old Testament had to be fulfilled. In Luke, he does that. Of course, I'm just trying to add to what we don't see here. All these things happen in this event that we're reading right here tonight. He, he uh, confirms to them, you know, that he's really risen from the dead. They, they really had to believe this to go out and preach the gospel. And he confirms the Great Commission through Luke, uh, as I said before. And he tells them to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. And so often we hear a great deal of the gospel leaving out the fact that this is what the gospel is about, that people can have their sins forgiven and, uh, and, and they must repent. And that was the first message of John the Baptist, the first message of Jesus. Repent. Repent. We must turn. That's what that word means. To God, and so so we see all these things. We do see in Luke that he does not rebuke them, but he asks them, "Why are you troubled? Why are you troubled? And why are you and I troubled?" I think I touched on that. Might have been last week in my message on Peter, but uh, but those are the things that happened this evening. This is the as I said in that first verse, and this is my key verse. I'm going to go down to the to the focus I want to have today, because I don't think everybody has uh, has ever thought through. Do we tell, we talk about this this morning? Do we just come on Sunday morning because it's tradition? I think most of us in a boomer generation, we were raised to go to church on Sunday morning, and so we just keep doing it, right? Why do we come on Sunday morning? And so today I want to focus on that, and the key verse here is, is verse 19. He says, then the same day at evening. Now, this is the same day of the resurrection. The same day at evening being the first day of the week. There it is. Really, if we believe God's word is what we believe it is, God's word, and he can't lie, and there's no mistakes in the course in the original, this would have been an easy translation when they translated it. Um, this is the first day of the week, and... This is the day he was resurrected. The first day of the week is Sunday. The eighth day is what? Sunday. It's the first day of each week. And so really, this, this should be enough really to convince us, if you think about it, if we say, I believe the Word of God, but I'm going to give you enough today. I want to give you enough information of history to confirm that there'll never ever be a doubt again in our hearts and minds of anybody that watches this video, uh, watches this message, the Sundays today we're supposed to worship on. I remember at Easter time on Facebook, there was a post of, of uh, one of my friends on the Facebook. It was quite long, but I, I found it interesting and I read it, but he talked about Easter and he talked about all the negative of Easter, and he's a believer, supposedly, and uh, and he told about what Easter originally was about, and I'm just going to give you a few of the things about it here. Um, let's see, I've got it here somewhere. Well...
Basically, he talked about it being a pagan holiday. I can't even see it in my notes. And I don't follow my notes real good, as you may know. Uh, but today I've got to follow my notes. But anyway, Easter was a pagan holiday. Easter was a day where they worshipped the fertility goddess. Easter was, and this was all, and this was a long, and had a lot of facts in it. Easter um, was a day that uh, was not a Christian holiday, according to this post. I found my notes here right in front of me. And the resurrection was not on Sunday, according to this post. It was very, very long. It had a lot of information about the worshiping of and the goddesses and goddesses in different countries and all had a great deal of information. And was it true? Well, a lot of it was true. And it really had to make you think. But the thing that was not true was that it said that, that uh, the resurrection was not on Sunday, that Easter was not on Sunday that we celebrate. That was not true. The early church, in the early church, we have a great deal of information. And, and here's where I'm going to give you the information. May you always understand and believe and know that we're not just in tradition worshiping here on Sunday. We are worshiping the day that the early church worshiped. It says in the, the uh, history of the church, it says that in the early church, that Constantine declared Sunday to be a Christian Sabbath for the Roman Empire in 321 AD. But it also said that they were already, most of the church already celebrating that day. So there it is. All right, today, let us settle this in our mind. I'm going to read some of the history. First of all, just a couple of scriptures from, from uh, from the Bible first. We don't have a lot about it in the Bible, but so that's the only way the liar, the post uh, like this can happen is because people can fall for it because there's not a lot said in the Bible about it. But uh, we have it verse 19 here. The first day when he resurrected, the same evening, uh, the first day of the week it says. So there's our first scripture. Revelation 1.10 says the apostle John, in Revelation, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of trumpet. Now, that, that doesn't tell as much, but he was worshiping in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He calls it the Lord's day. Acts 20 and 7 says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together, now this is in Acts 20, verse 7, Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his, his speaking until midnight. You may or may not remember the story, but Eutychus, I think it was, was sitting on the third level and fell, out, fell down to the, to the ground and was dead. And Paul went and prayed for him and brought him back to life. But that was the, the Lord's day. Okay, now, the early church fathers is where we get most of our information. Most of us don't read the church fathers. We, we barely fit in reading the word as good as we should. But, uh, but today I'm going to give you enough information that you'll know. The Lord's day is Sunday. The resurrection is Sunday. All right, so let me go through them. Ignatius the Bishop of Antioch, who lived during the time of the Apostles. Um, Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch, was also a, a, a friend of Polycarp, and they both were discipled by John the Apostle himself. And this was, uh, he lived, I guess, 30 A.D. to 107 A.D. And uh, here's what he, quote, a quote from him. Let every friend of Christ keep the Lord's day as a festival, the resurrection day, the queen and chief of all days of the week, on which our lives spring, sprang up again and victory over death was obtained in Christ. So there's one or two different people, 
our, what we call church, one of the, the church fathers that walked with the apostle John that gives us that verse. In the epistle of Barnabas, and Barnabas, as you know in scripture, was a friend of, of, uh, of Apostle Paul. And it has been verified, the, the book of Barnabas, the epistle of Barnabas, by the way, has been verified by two or three of the uh, church people, by Clements and Origen and some other church fathers, that he had a prophecy. And the prophecy I, I find is very interesting. He, here's his prophecy. I will make a beginning of another day that is a beginning of another world. Wherefore also we keep the eighth day with joyfulness, the day on which Jesus rose again from the dead. So we've already, in these two quotes I've given you, also mentioned two or three or four other church fathers. We also see where they're talking about worshiping on Sunday. Justin Martyr, most of us have recognized the name. He was born in 110 AD. He writes this. He says, And on the day called Sunday, all who live in the cities and in the country gather together in one place, and the writings of the apostles and the prophets are read. Because Sunday is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in darkness and matter, made the world. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day, rose from the dead. I find that one statement very interesting. He says, having wrought a change in darkness and matter, made the world. So God made the world, began making the world on, according to him, Sunday. All right, Tertullian, a presbyter who was born about 145 A.D., he writes this. Unlike the Jews, in other words, the Jews who worship on Saturday, unlike the Jews, have a festive day every eighth day. What's the eighth day? Sunday. Okay, you have a couple writings and a couple books that uh, they talk about the Lord's Day. One of them's uh, the teachings of 12 apostles. The other is uh, the teachings of the apostles. Both of them written different times. Both of them mention that we are to honor the eighth day. In fact, one or two of them even said they felt like we ought to celebrate the eighth day and honor it. Just like we honor Washington's birthday or something of that nature. We ought to honor it uh, because Jesus was resurrected on that day. Irenaeus, in 178 A.D., he says, the mystery of the Lord's resurrection may not be celebrated on the other day, on any other day than the Lord's day. And on this alone we observe the Passover feast. He also mentions Pentecost as having been, you may or may not have known that, as having been on Sunday. Theophilus, pastor of Antioch in 162 AD, says, both custom and reason challenge us that we should honor the Lord's day. Seen on that day, it was that our Lord completed his resurrection from the dead. And, you know, and, and there's others. I, I, that was eight or nine of them. And uh, you've got others like Origen in 200 AD and a man called Victorinius in 300 AD. You've got, you got others that uh, truth and fact from history says that the church, even before Constantine declared it a the Christian holiday or the day to celebrate, proclaimed that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Now, that should be enough. All our church fathers, those that even walked with John the, and was discipled by John the Apostle, and so they passed this down from generation to generation, and here we are on Sunday. So I hope that's enough for you. The historian, one of the fathers, called the father of church history, uh, of the time of the birth of Christ, says this, from the beginning, Christians assembled on the first day of the week, called by them the Lord's Day, for the purpose of worship, reading of the scriptures, and to celebrate 
the Lord's day. The first day of the week in which the Savior obtained victory over death. What a what a glorious thing. You can't, uh, you know, a lot of things you can't corroborate more than two or three times in a court uh, case with a judge and a court and a jury, you know, just two or three witnesses is all it takes to condemn someone or to confirm something to be a truth. And here we have, how many did I give you? Eight, nine, ten, whatever. And the father of the church uh, historian. Uh, okay, so closing, let me say this. I want to read some scriptures to you. Genesis, you don't need to turn there. I'm going to jump to uh, two different chapters, basically. But two, two, two different places in one of the chapters. In Genesis 21.4, I want to talk to you and just mention to you about circumcision. It talks about circumcision in the law of God was on the eighth day. This, I do not believe, was a coincidence. On the eighth day, the children, by law, are to be, and I guess still are, circumcised on the eighth day. What did we say was the eighth day? Sunday's the first day of the week. The eighth day is Sunday, the beginning of the next week. And circumcision was on the eighth day. In Genesis 21, 4, it says, And Abraham, the father of faith, circumcised his son Isaac, being the eight days old, eighth day, as God had commanded him. So I, I don't believe, I really don't believe it's a coincidence. I believe it was purpose in circumcision being on the eighth day, eighth day is to proclaim a new covenant, is to proclaim a new life, the born again experience, is to proclaim the day and be a picture and a shadow of the day that our hearts are circumcised when we make Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. In Genesis 17, 10, a little more about Abraham, God says, this is my covenant, which you shall keep. Between me and you and thy seed after thee, every man, child, among you shall be circumcised. This is Genesis 17, 10, 11, and 12. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. Everyone that claimed to be in the same faith as Abraham or to be circumcised on the eighth day, a picture of the circumcision of our hearts the day that we're saved. It's no coincidence that we worship, uh, worship on Sunday. And lastly, about Abraham, in the same chapter but further on in verse 24, it says, And Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised. Ninety-nine years old. Brothers and sisters, it is not a coincidence. It is not just tradition that we worship on Sunday. That was the plan all along. That's why circumcision, I believe, was on Sunday. It's the beginning of a new covenant for me and you. The first, the, it's a, in the first creation, it took six days, and he rested on the seventh the eighth day the new is the new creation. It's a shadow with Abraham with the circumcision of the eighth day. God starting a new thing, a new creation. I want you to listen just, we're about to close here, but I want you to listen just one or two verses here. In Revelation 3.14, it says this about Jesus. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, talking about Jesus, the faithful and true witness, and listen to this, the beginning of the creation of God. Jesus is the beginning of the new covenant. He's the beginning of the new world. He's the beginning of the new earth. He's the beginning of the new church, the new covenant, and all it belongs to the new creation. If you remember correctly, the prophecy that if I'm finding here, the prophecy 
that we have uh, by, in, by Barnabas. Listen to what he said and see if you fit that in with what we just read. He says, I will make a beginning of another day. That is the beginning of another world. Wherefore also we keep the eighth day, and he goes on. Sunday represents a new day. It represents a new birth. It represents the day you are circumcised in your heart. It represents a new covenant. And Jesus Christ is coming back, and we're going to have a the old the old is going to be burned. It's not going to be flooded with water again, he tells us. It's going to be burned by fire, and we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. And I bet that's going to happen on a Sunday. It just lines up with the scripture. Well, I pray that uh, that, that was enough information that that it'll confirm in your heart. You'll never have to question by reading one of these things like this Facebook, because it was pretty convincing. It had a lot of truth in it about Easter, pagan holiday, and that kind of stuff. It had a lot of truth in it, but it lied about the fact that Jesus was not resurrected. It said on Sunday, as you heard in all these uh, writings of the church fathers. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your truth. Father, we thank you that this is also confirmation to our hearts that Christianity is the right way to go. We're worshiping on the right day, not like the Jehovah Witnesses that are worshiping on Saturday, or the Seventh-day Adventists, I'm sorry, that worship on Saturday. They do not have the truth. The truth is Jesus resurrected on Sunday. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we've been showing the truth. We thank you for the historical records that confirm to us that this is the truth. And Lord God, we thank you for resurrecting. We thank you for making us new creatures in you and giving us the hope and the knowledge that we're forgiven for our sins and that we can look to the future and we're waiting on you to return. We know it's close and we say even so, Lord, come quickly. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.